So let me ask you something. You have to invent a new sport. What is it? That's all. No strings attached. No limitations. You can make up literally whatever you feel like. So now with that prompt, how long do you think it would be before you settled on a girls-only sport where people use World War II-era tanks to battle in teams until either all enemy tanks are eliminated or the designated flag tank of either team is eliminated? Probably never, I'd guess. So, enter the world of Girls and Panzer, where some absolute maniac not only had that exact idea, but they also made it real. Girls and Panzer is one of my favorite anime, purely by virtue of how just absolutely ridiculous it is at all times. The world, the characters, the sport they all participate in is all just so detached from any reasonability and logic. You quickly just stop questioning things and just sort of let all of the nonsense play out in front of you and have a good time. And it is my hope to tell you about much of this nonsense today. However, before I begin, I would like to make two important prefaces. One, I know absolutely nothing of substance about tanks. If you want to see some fucking nerd talk about the tanks and other historical references within the series, I would highly recommend checking out the videos by Potential History. He talks about basically any detail you could ever want about any of the tanks that they show, and just a lot of the other fun details that are in there. Second, I will only be talking about the Girls in Panzer anime series, film, OVAs, and the first two parts of the finale. So, while I might mention something from one of the manga spinoffs in passing, I'm not going to be discussing them in detail. With that said, let's jump into the unadulterated insanity of Girls in Panzer. For sake of giving more context than none at all, let me just give you the broad strokes of the series. This is Miho Nishizumi, she participates in Senshido, where tanks battle each other in teams. She is the youngest daughter of the Nishizumi family, which is famous for its Senshido techniques. And one day, her mother disowns her because she goes to save a teammate from drowning, which costs their team the match. Miho then joins Ori Girls Academy, but the school is going to get shut down if they don't win the upcoming National Senshido Tournament. Miho and the Ori gang proceed to get some tanks together and battle their way through several teams of varying foreign stereotypes, finally beating her older sister and her former school to win the tournament. Following this, the movie reveals that the school was shut down anyway, but as one last attempt to save their school, they agreed to a match against the All-Star University team, and with the help of the other schools that they beat in the tournament, they form a super team and manage to beat the All-Stars and their leader, Alice. Continue further into the Girls and Panzer DOS finale series, which is currently ongoing and features the Ori girls having to win the tournament yet again in order for one of their student council members on the team to graduate. It's... Not a paragon of storytelling by any stretch, it's just very dumb fun. But now that you have some handle on what goes on, let me tell you why it's really, really stupid. So when you hear that it's a sport about tank battles, I'm sure a number of questions go through your head. Chiefly, how do they not... die? Well, don't worry. The tanks have carbon in them. The inside of the tanks are coated with carbon, so it'll be fine. Don't worry. While I initially thought this sounded very silly, when I did research, it does appear that carbon lining can reinforce a variety of things. Combine this with the show also claiming that both the tank's armor and shells have been specialized for the sport's non-lethal purposes. It's okay. They use live rounds and matches, but they're used with an emphasis on the participant's safety. The explanation, though not detailed, is there. And yet... <laughs> it's fair to not believe them when they claim that there isn't an incredibly high chance of danger in this sport. What if you ignore the ammunition side of this discussion and just focus on the machinery itself? These are tanks. They weigh several dozen tons, and the series is no stranger to simply having tanks drive over or crash into each other at high speeds. One bad angle and someone's skull is gonna get crushed. Or hey, what about when something goes wrong and the tank ends up in a disadvantageous environment? You know, maybe it falls into the ocean, for example. 
These tanks aren't amphibious, and now you have to try and escape through a tank hatch with the pressure of the ocean pushing back at you. But don't worry about any of that, because the characters don't, so why bother? What they do worry about instead are the rules. The rules that no sports commission would ever approve of. For starters, team size. Take, for example, the battle between Ori and Saunders. Ori has a team of five tanks because they just started participating in the sport and that's all they have. Saunders has ten tanks. Or there's the fight between Ori and Kuramori Mine, where it's eight versus twenty. Or how about the match against the All-Star team, where prior to the other teams showing up, it's eight versus thirty. Obviously, part of the fun of the series comes from the underdog nature of these fights, where the main characters are at a disadvantage, but consider the in-universe domino effect of schools who have more money being able to buy more tanks that let them have a bigger advantage over schools who don't have lots of money in tanks, so that they can win tournaments, get more money, buy more tanks, and keep winning, in the whole process becoming more prestigious and getting more students. Basically, this is unfair from the start, as while there is an upper limit on tanks allowed in a battle, there's no minimum requirement. It's like agreeing to an MMA fight, and then you show up and there's six guys waiting for you in the cage, and then when you lose, the winner just uses the fight money to hire a seventh guy. But hey, maybe there's a way we can balance this out. What if we just let the participants have nonsense super tanks? Well... Officially, the only tanks that are supposed to be available to the participants are tanks which were deployed, or at least designed, prior to the Japanese Day of Surrender in World War II. In the majority of cases, this just means a variety of traditional tanks with fairly marginal differences fighting each other. But this also means that some teams can just get some insanely powerful tanks and ungabunga their way to victory. Take, for example, Kuromori Mine's Mouse, a German super heavy tank known to be the heaviest armored fighting vehicle ever built. The tank is so massive and well armored that it takes no visible damage from multiple Ori tanks shooting directly at it. It takes the combined efforts of half the team just to beat it. Pravda Girls Academy has a KV-2, a tank with a 152mm howitzer that was originally used for bunker busting and artillery support, and that does this to an entire building. Jump ahead to the match against the All-Star team, as they have two tanks worth noting in this area of discussion. The T-28 Super Heavy Tank, which was originally designed to break through heavy German defensive lines, and much like the mouse, it's virtually indestructible and just annihilates any other tank that gets in its way. Lastly, we have the Karl Garat, a massive artillery cannon. And yes, I said artillery, because just before the match between Ori and the All-Stars team happens, the governing body of Senshido makes an exception to allow self-propelled guns to be used in matches, Thus, this literal giant cannon on wheels is allowed, with its 600mm cannon, which is using high explosive rounds and firing directly on opposing tanks. Just look at this moment. How on earth would this not completely destroy anything it hits? Everyone here should be dead just by virtue of being near it, let alone getting hit by it. And don't worry, they don't just drop the ball on rules during matches, but also on any rules about things between matches. There are several occasions when Yukari is shown just breaking into other schools to film and gather intel on them. In multiple instances, the opposing team is aware that she's done this, and they don't report it to anyone. There's no governing body that they tell about it. Forgive me if I'm being presumptuous, but isn't that grounds to forfeit the match? What if she broke in and sabotaged their tanks? What's the cutoff for when this is just a crime? There's also seemingly no rules when it comes to getting out of your tank during a match. Miho literally leaps between tanks at one point during the movie, 
and during the match between Orai and Pravda, both sides are just out of their tanks waiting for several hours. Yukari and Erwin even trick some of the opposing team into giving them intel. In the match with Anzio, you see some of the girls driving these little tankettes, and they're forced to get out and literally push their tank upright again when it flips. What if I kept shooting before I realized they'd gotten out? What happens then? There's also just some things that should definitely not be legal in the sport. During the match with Saunders, they just have a radio listening device, which is not illegal during a match despite the massive advantage it would give whether the opposing team realizes they have it or not. And in the match against Anzio, they have several cardboard decoys that look like tanks just to trick the Ori girls, which, while not an amazing trick, kind of implies that you could just bring in and use whatever you want during a match. Now, you might have also noticed something a bit odd in the clips you've seen thus far. Namely, right here. Notice how this battle is different from the others? Namely that it's happening in a city with actual buildings? Yeah, so while more commonly matches are sanctioned to take place in different areas away from society, there are also matches that are designated to areas in and around towns. Towns which are not abandoned or evacuated or anything. There are people in these buildings and walking around while these matches occur. Can you imagine you miss the memo to citizens about the upcoming tank match in town, and you just wake up to the entire first floor of your house just getting annihilated by a tank shell? Well, don't worry, because they just sort of mention that the League compensates people for any damage done to their property during the course of a match. Which, I can only imagine is a logistical and financial nightmare that in any reality would kneecap the sport completely the first time they had to try and actually figure it out. God, and the people walking around. Just look at this scene from the movie. Sure, they aren't supposed to fire in this area, but what if anything goes wrong? Just one bad turn, one guy with AirPods in, and now we've got a fatality. How about these moments when they're firing within areas where people are near enough to be hit? If not the people, what about the building they're on? I wouldn't feel safe unless I was in a different state, let alone I'm walking right next to the damn thing. So, the actual sport of Senchido is... Nonsense. I really cannot think of a better way to describe it. But let's pull back and look at the strange world that houses Senshido. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, 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 um. Not only the schools that every character goes to, but also the towns surrounding them are entirely on aircraft carriers. Just the whole thing on an aircraft carrier. The sheer size of these boats would have to be astronomical, both to simply contain the necessary amount of space for all of this, and to house the infrastructure for plumbing and electricity and everything else you could think of, which everyone on the boat has. Why are they on aircraft carriers? To produce highly trained individuals capable of excelling in any field, to give students the ability to achieve academic and personal success. That's why they built the school ship, supposedly. And it's not clear why other people live on the ship either. Some of them are family to the students, but others are, I guess, just business owners and old people and whoever else. Oh, and don't jump to any conclusions. The mainland is fine. They go there for matches and other stuff. So these schools being on boats is by choice. Are there land schools? Are there similar school boats for boys? What about universities? Don't worry about it. The aircraft carriers themselves are also seemingly run by an entire offshoot of the student body, which I will dub the girls und boot. You see them living in and operating the lower decks of the ship, but barring the shark team, they're rarely ever even acknowledged. There's even an offshoot of the offshoot of just a bunch of delinquent sailor girls who, I guess, are just occupying space without any issue inside the bowels of the ship. This makes it very notable that the crux of both the show and the movie is the school being shut down and the boat being decommissioned. 
which would mean the displacement of easily a few thousand people, which could be astoundingly life-ruining for that many people. Do I finish paying my house mortgage if it's on the boat? Do I own my own patch of boat? Or am I just renting? Do I have to follow Japanese laws even out on the open ocean? Who knows, and apparently who cares? Back to the tanks, many of the drivers are officially licensed to drive their tanks. Thus, we see several instances of them simply driving around like you would in a regular car. And hey, while we're on the subject, these same girls also have access to airplanes, helicopters, several automobiles, more boats, and trains. I'm not saying they can't operate these things, just that maybe a governing body that would allow this level of freedom when it comes to what they can have in their possession might be setting themselves up for some Metal Gear type shenanigans. And to finish out this section, I want to talk about my favorite weird thing in the entire series. Boko. Boko, or as he's called in the dub, Punchy, is a character beloved by both Miho and Alice, as demonstrated by their collections of merchandise. Despite having many variations in design, he always looks extremely beat up and bruised. But the anime goes by without ever giving us much detail. You just see him in the background a bit. However, during the film, there's a period where they go to the Boko Museum, and you see a stage performance of what a typical Boko episode involves. And it's just several minutes of a group of other animals pummeling him on the ground while he begs for them to stop and for the crowd to give him strength. And when he gets up to fight them, he just falls on the ground and starts getting beat up again. Both Miho and Alice emphasize how they like Boko because he never gives up and always keeps fighting, which is a positive takeaway, but based on what we see and the depictions of Boko being exclusively beat up all the time, you can just assume that he never actually wins any of the fights that he gets into. They even acknowledge how weird it is. Miho, Alice, and a couple of the spinoff characters are the only ones who actually seem really into Boko. Every other character just doesn't get it and thinks it's weird. I, I think it's so funny anytime they acknowledge it, how all of the other characters not only think it's weird, but are genuinely off-put by just how much Miho or Alice likes it. And now to round out this whole thing. The characters are the nonsense glue that holds this whole mess together, so I just kind of want to mention some characters or moments with them that really stand out in my mind and that I just want people to know without much context. This bitch disowned her teenage daughter for losing a match so that one of her teammates wouldn't die. Shiho Nishizumi is a psychopath, and you should not be letting her teach your children. The only redeeming thing she ever did was help get Orai the chance to fight the All-Star team, which she only wanted so that Kuromori Mine could have the chance to beat them in next year's tournament and exact revenge. I cannot stress enough, this woman is a menace to society. Momo wears a monocle, but not like the Monopoly kind, it's the half of a pair of glasses kind. Shinzaburo is an apprentice to Hannah's family and just straight up carries Hannah's mom around in a rickshaw and nobody thinks it's weird. Saki from the rabbit team is just Saki's trying to tell us something. Uh -huh. Pretty. Uh -huh. She's fun. Sotoko and the Hall Monitor's entire self-worth is destroyed when the school is briefly shut down during the movie. Just think about where you'd have to be at mentally to be this devastated by the loss of the place where you just track who shows up late in the morning. The Anteaters, a team of hard R gamers, work out so much during the downtime during the movie that they are just one-handed tossing around and loading tank shells, and one of them pulls a lever so hard they just straight up break it off of the tank. In DOS Finale Part 1, there's a moment when the main girls meet the shark team, and when it seems like they're about to have a fight, Yukari just has a fucking grenade ready. She has a fucking grenade ready. 
This is Rosehip, and this is her solution to defeat a single enemy tank. Also, in one of the spinoffs, one of the English girls is just named Earl Grey. There's this moment where the American team is just eating a bunch of fast food while they're flying a plane. Alyssa, one of the members of the American team, has this ongoing storyline where she's severely depressed that a boy doesn't love her and won't notice her. Why does Takashi like her? Why doesn't he realize how I feel? <laughs> if we win, maybe he'll notice me. The Italian team members are legitimately named Anchovy, Carpaccio, and Pepperoni. Also, the mere mention of pasta makes them excessively excited. You you so what if I cooked you some dried potato pasta? Huh? Pasta? Pasta. Kachusha is the best girl, and also, she loves Call of Duty. Hey, you two! I told you, no Russian! Now it's back! The girl that Miho saved during the match that got her disowned apparently didn't even get to say thanks to Miho, because she has to say it before the final match of the tournament, which implies an insanely fast turnaround time on Miho getting kicked out. The entire Imperial Japanese team is just obsessed with charging during fights, so much so that their other tactics are just referred to as different types of charges, even if they're retreating. During the best scene in the movie, Mika here is just playing her Kantel, while the other two do literally all of the work. The leader of the French team is named Marie, and she eats cake all the time. Oh, and she does this, which very easily could have resulted in a horrifyingly brutal death. On the subject of the French, one of the spin-off characters for the French team is just named Asparagus. And lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't draw special attention to one of the schools featured in DOS Finale. Koala Forest Academy, the Australian school, is commanded by an actual koala and his vice commander, Wallaby. Like I said at the start, this show is not some paragon of storytelling or artistic merit or anything meaningful like that. I really hope I've been able to articulate just how much dumb nonsense there is in this show. But it doesn't take itself super seriously. It knows that it's dumb nonsense and it's having fun. And honestly, that's the approach that anyone watching it or hearing about it should have with it. So if you want something stupid and fun, and you just want to see cute girls drive tanks, give Girls and Panzer a look. You might like it.